Hi, hello everyone. Uh, on behalf of all of us in Tow Magazine, I would like to thank you all for joining us uh, today for the conference uh, Afrofuturism, Arab Futurism, and the Search for New Dimensions. Uh, we are extremely excited about today since uh, this is not only our first public event as Tow Magazine, but it is also uh, one that developed in a natural way from the content uh, and agenda of our magazine. In June of last year, we published an essay titled uh, Afrofuturism and Arab Futurism, Reflections of a Present-Day Diasporic Reader. It was a review written by Lama Suleiman, uh, who is one of the organizers of today's uh, conference. Um, it was a review of a recently published book titled Afrofuturism 2.0, The Rise of uh, Astro Blackness. Uh, the, this wonderful text explored the relevance of Afrofuturistic um, thought and cultural expression to Arab and Palestinian uh, culture and looked into contemporary expressions, uh, contemporary works uh, that uh, displayed uh, Arab futurism, a term that is still under construction, I would say, and under examination. Uh, Lama's essay received wide uh, local and international distribution, as well as many, many responses. One of the conversations uh, that started then was uh, with uh, Dr. Reynaldo Anderson, a co-editor of the reviewed book, who we are honored to have as our um, keynote speaker today. Uh, in fact, uh, the upcoming uh, conference uh, continues the pioneering discourse opened in the article and expands it further. Uh, the speakers will present Afro and Arab uh, futuristic uh, arguments and will explore the relevance of ethno-futuristic or speculative thinking uh, to art and culture in the Middle East. The conference is held in English, a second language for most, for most of us, a fact we recognize uh, as one of the features of today's event, dealing with inhabiting strange and other spaces, uh, not necessarily ones we are very comfortable or comfortably placed in. Uh, each presentation uh, will be followed by a 10-minute uh, Q&A session uh, in which we invite you to uh, raise questions or uh, concerns or uh, thoughts uh, that you kind of accumulated throughout the, the talk. Uh, before we begin, I would like to first and foremost uh, thank our supporters and subscribers. subscribers. Uh, you are the ones that are making all of this happen, really. Uh, we are grateful to you and hope this conference will live up to your expectations. Uh, we really value readers' expe expectations and we welcome every, any kind of feedback. Uh, without boring you with too many names, I would also like to thank Nira El and Elinor Salomon, who are responsible for a big part of this conference and also a big part of Tohu Magazine in general. Uh, our editorial board members and translators are really the active force behind the magazine. Uh, they reside all over the world. Some of them are here, and actually some of them uh, will take part in uh, the conference. Uh, lastly, I would like to thank uh, Basis Art School and uh, Rankas Milan, director and curator of Artist Residence in Erzelia, for their hospitality. And of course, to the speakers in today's uh, conference, to which you will all be introduced uh, shortly. Thank you very much uh, for joining us today, and I hope you'll enjoy the conference. Thank you. Okay, so I'm not greetings anymore. Now I just want to present uh, the first speaker, the keynote speaker of this uh, conference today, Dr. Reynaldo Anderson. Uh, Dr. Uh, Reynaldo Anderson uh, currently serves as an associate professor uh, of communication and chair of humanities at Harris Stowe Uni uh, State University in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, Reynaldo has earned several awards for leadership and teaching excellence and he is currently the chair of the Black Caucus of the National Communication Association, NCA. Reynaldo has not only served as an executive board member of the Missouri Arts Cure, a Council, he has previously served as an international level working for prison reform with Cure. International in Douala, Cameroon, and as a development ambassador recently assisting in the completion of the library project for Cessier Afram Plains district in the country of Ghana. Reynaldo recently co-curated the acclaimed exhibition Unveiling Vision, the Alchemy of the Black Imagination at Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture in Harlem, New York. 
He publishes extensively in the area of Afrofuturism, communication studies, uh, and the African diaspora experience. Uh, Rinaldo is currently the executive director and co-founder of the Black Speculative Art Movement, uh, BSAM, a network of artists, curators, intellectuals, and activists. Uh, finally, he is the co-editor of the book Afrofuturism 2.0, The Rise of a uh, Astro-Blackness, published by Lexington Book in December 2015, and the editor of forthcoming volume, The Black Speculative Art Movement, Black Futurity, Art Plus Design, to be released in 2017. Well, I'm going to try and sound as impressive as that bio um, <laughs> that has emerged, and it's all really taken place quite rapidly the last uh, couple years. And... Um, a lot of the concepts that I'm talking to you about have emerged out of a series of events that are part of this presentation. And this idea of what dark speculative futurity, neo-nationalism in relation to recent events um, related to whether Brexit, Trump's election, and some other things that I want to talk about. That uh, picture there is actually, uh, those of you that have seen the book cover, um, re recognize it where the female head other figure is the book cover for 2.0 volume. The male half of it is the cover for the follow-up anthology on the Black Speculative Art Movement, and that came out of a conversation between me and the artist John Jennings. Um, where do art, social justice, and fear, futurity intersect right now? After the Ferguson unrest uh, in my country, some of you might have heard about the Michael Brown killing. That happened. Some of my students were involved with that movement, and I was an advisor to one of the campus organizations that was heavily involved with uh, the aftermath of the Ferguson unrest. Um, and we had a big conference, a major meeting at Princeton University talking about the concept Ferguson is the future, this dystopian set of people rioting in relation to um, local power structures and sense of injustice. And one of the things that I always share with people about what happened uh, with Ferguson, a lot of the true story of it hasn't come out yet. Uh, for example, following the killing of Michael Brown, um, for about a month, uh, most of that movement and the activities were carried out primarily by poor, undereducated, or poor, unemployed young black people. Okay, it was not started by Black Lives Matter and these other NGOs that came in later. And, and, and a lot of it, um, I think, that is also under-discussed is the role that online hackers played in assisting the protesters in terms of uh, disabling local communications with law enforcement um, and exposing some of what was going on on the Internet. So I think what was shocking about it was this spontaneous protest that emerges, and you see this collaboration between poor people and hackers uh, that kept it going. For example, the young group I work with on campus, the way we communicated with each other was using the technology GroupMe at the time. And of course, later we found out recently how um, a lot of the activists at that time were under surveillance, surveillance with a corporation out of Chicago that was monitoring all of the online activity. And I think one of the things, and this quote is not my quote, it's from a scholar here about the uh, multiculturalism does not influence the socio-political imagination. I think it was one of those things at that time where, of course, because we live in America, if you're an African-American, there's no racism anymore because we had a black president. And, of course, that was swiftly kind of... Um, uh, challenged and gotten out of the way recently, and that's why a lot of the younger generation really kind of looked at Obama as slowing down our, pro our uh, progress rather than helping to accelerate it and speeding up. And, and he left office. He, he pretty much represented the last gasp of neoliberalism in American politics. Um, let me see. Now, one thing where it talks about in this title where arts and all this intersects, all of a sudden now it's fashionable for artists to be political again. Uh, and this quote I got from Plekhanov, who wrote uh, in a book, Art and Social Life, over 100 years ago. And I lifted it out. It said, uh, society is not made for the artist, but the artist for society. Art must promote or gesture 
to the development of human consciousness and improvement of the social order. And one of the things I wrote and in an essay at the time that was later published about Ferguson, I talked about what was going on was a fight over the socio-political imagination of black people, uh, you know, to make it seem as though this stuff, the, the young, poor, or the undereducated, and the few white allies they had at the time were crazy or insane. And I remember uh, Mike Brown's uncle was in my class that fall, you know, and basically what a lot of these young people would experience what would later be called post-traumatic stress syndrome. And the local police in meetings were telling the civic society the way they were going to contain the situation. They were using words like, oh, we're doing um, counterintelligence and uh, treating the activities and tactics as though it were Iraq, okay, on American citizens. And so what, what, there was even some humor in it along the way. I remember uh, one of my student leaders, she graduated later that year in spring 2015, but I remember she was late coming to class one day from a protest and her, and her glasses were like cocked on the side of her head from protesting. And I told her that to, she still had to take my exam <laughs> at the time. And, and, I told, and I talked to him about the history of the civil rights movement and some other issues where uh, people still maintain their daily activities in spite of what protests they were involved in. And you know, whether they'd been tear, tear gassed or hit by rubber bullets. And it was during that time that a lot of the young people in Ferguson uh, developed a relationship with some of the Palestinian people who at that time told us the best way to deal with tear gas was to put milk in our eyes at the time. And then it was later discovered that it was an American corporation that had um, uh, was using the same tear gas on people in St. Louis that they'd used in the Middle East. So this was kind of a political education process for the young people where they swiftly were learning these things in real time and you have people showing up and this is where I think some of the things related to solidarity were disrupted and and it was an epiphany, an important moment that I think people will recall uh, and I like to say if the political right deals with trickle down economics the political left deals with trickle down ideology and what I mean by that is uh, after one of the protests, one of the young people came up to me when all these people from out of town started showing up, was they were like, well, Dr. Anderson, what is this, this intersectionality thing? I thought we were fighting the police. And this becomes a problem where uh, the distinction between um, theory, theoretical criticism, and practical criticism and a lot of the protesters were more interested in being practical in terms of what works in their local environment. And you had people pop up, they might, every other day you might run into an anarchist, a communist, uh, a syndicalist, uh, various strains of feminists, and the people who this was impacting didn't ha don't have time to sit down and read these treatises and whatever, trying to apply it. They were engaged in action and learning from their actions and was, inf was informing their politics. So what is neo-nationalism? One of the things that I think a, 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 a growing viewpoint to explain what has happened in the last year Neo-nationalism didn't just emerge because of Trump's election or Brexit. It had been slowly really growing for a generation, uh, particularly in Western countries and, and, and around the world. It's characterized by high-tech populism and networks rather than nation states. It's a revolt against elites on both sides, you know, a rejection of uh, on, uh, many are familiar with the conservative um, uh, or the left's critique of the conservative elite, but uh, what is frequently left out but is growing, and I think maybe some of the European scholars and other countries have been much more sophisticated about this, that on the left, their own elites uh, in particular, and in the European Union and other countries, the left basically makes a truce in order to get state power in the 90s, and so this reaction that leads to neo-nationalism is the failure of the left to make the state live up to what it was promised to do in terms of delivering jobs, services, and other things related to that. Uh, several years ago, Zbigniew Brzezinski, one of the founders of the Trilateral Commission and an advisor to President Jimmy Carter, and then a young uh, Barack Obama during his presidential campaign, 
said, in earlier times, it was easier to control a million people literally than physically ki to kill a million people, while today it is now easier to kill a million people than to control a million people. And he said this, I think, 2008 or 9. And because he's one of the intellectual elites that actually had the audacity to say this in public, I think they've put him away in the quiet room somewhere for trying to expose what the elite really thinks of the masses. However, when we talk about neo-nationalism also, it really starts in the 90s. And I agree with some of the other scholars that really it starts in 1995 would be a good benchmark year. I remember watching on TV, seeing what happened to the with the assassination of Rabin. Uh, in 95, you have the emergence of the internet in terms of organizing. You also have the Million Man March in Washington, D.C. in 95, which is a reaction to uh, conservative leadership in American government. But all of these things also are not, are, uh, this is the early stages of globalization and what elites are trying to do to reorganize world order following the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I also say uh, when you talk about the collapse of the Berlin Wall, you should also talk about the collapse of the apartheid system by the early 90s also. Because without the fall of apartheid, you cannot create the African Union without that. So following these twin events, um, and at that time, um, you get uh, Nelson Mandela, who has to, who was forced to embrace neoliberal policies, and that's why a lot of times people are putting them in the same picture. But you know, they were sides of the same coin. They both forced to adopt neoliberal policies in order um, to govern their um, societies. Then the term dark enlightenment, uh, coined by Nick Land, uh, it's an era of techno-libertarian determinism characterized by reactionaries and neo-social Darwinism. Uh, interestingly enough, and there are people who disagree when they talk about techno-libertarianism, um, but primarily a lot of techno-libertarians, one of them is Peter Thiel, who I believe uh, created PayPal, who was one of the big early backers of Donald Trump happens to be a gay white man uh, um, who backed him, which people thought a lot of that was contradictory in terms of what his politics should represent. But at that time, I think that Thiel and others who are, who are, are techno-libertarians uh, want Trump to, um, uh, along with the white nationalist Steve Bannon, they are trying to weaken the state in terms of eliminating its capacity to, to improve the lives of people. And I think a lot of the techno-libertarians believe that this is going to usher in a transformation in society that's overdue, which is why a lot of the leaders of this movement in North America uh, have a uh, serious intellectual relationship with people from Britain, such as uh, Farage and others, in relation to Brexit. Now. In, a, in the United States, at least, this is leading to a coll uh, collapse of the post-racial project. But, and this is one of the developments in recent Afrofuturist thought-wise gained such popularity. Um, one of the things about the current wave of Afrofuturist thought is not necessarily focused on goals or aspirations of neoliberal diversity or multiculturalism. Uh, scholars like... Um, Slavar Zizek, did I pronounce his name right? Made the observation back at the 90s that multiculturalism was primarily developed to further corporate interests in order to sell products and goods. You know, a good example of this might be somebody like Michael Jordan, you know, put a person of color on it to sell some shoes all around the world, make it look like you embrace difference, um, but the bottom line was a corporate interest. Um, and this, the, I think the other thing when he talks about the thought is not anti-diversity, is really the thought I'd want to add to this, the idea of to complete the decolonization project. In a lot of the, uh, what used to be called the third world, what was left behind was neocolonialism. And it wasn't really, um, and that's why I always tease some of my friends up when I ask them what do they mean by post-colonial. And a lot of the problems in the United States when they talk about segregation being over going into desegregation, we had a form of neocolonialism there also where they used uh, uh, policies of affirmative action to attract um, a small number of people or minorities to into the government, into corporate industry, starting in the 70s and 80s, in, in order to 
accommodate or take the pressure off of the previous um, lines and, and rules and bureaucracies that used to keep people or people that were different out, such as immigrants, many minorities. And a lot of this thought of Afrofuturism traces its origin back to the speculative writings of Martin Delaney in the middle of the 19th century in his um, book called The Hut, uh, which dealt with a slave revolution and founding their own republic, and the scholar W.B. Du Bois. And this helped these writings, along with, other, uh, with others of the time, help lay the foundation for what we're now talking about in terms of an Africana futurist paradigm. So how do we get here in relation to art? This is just a small, very small collection. I understand it's much more extensive in terms of politics surrounding art for the last hundred years, and most, uh, many of you are much more knowledgeable than I am about it. Some argue it comes ever since the French Revolution, but there's some before that. Um, and I want to add before, I, while I'm going through, uh, I believe Avi and them said they'll, they will email a copy of this PowerPoint to anyone who really wants a copy of it following the conference. Um, Plekhanov Art and Social Life comes out around the second decade of the 20th century, um, which dealt with the social conditions related to art and this idea of art for art's sake. And one of the things I like about Plekhanov when he talks about, no one talks about uh, it doesn't make sense to talk about art for art's sake when we criticize it, because no one would say, well, I'm just doing wealth for wealth's sake. No, you do something with it. You know, Science is funded to do something. Uh, Clement Greenberg, avant-garde, and Kitsch, in response to the inability or some of the disappointment with socialism at the time. And some of my friends at the Frankfurt School, last uh, year at a, at a uh, conference, uh, we call it Planet Deep South, I made the statement that I can define Afrofuturism and work it out completely without citing any of the Frankfurt School critics uh, in terms of some of them being anti-black and other limitations that they had specifically with Adorno and jazz and, and, um, <laughs> and, uh, and, so, and some of these other ideas that the Frankfurt School came out with that are problem. Harold Cruz's book, The Crisis of the Negro Intellectual, that comes out in the mid-60s, I think is going, and it's a benchmark in terms of how it talks about the relation to art and social life, particularly of black people in America at the time, when he talked that the intellectual division was primarily between liberals and nationalists. And basically, you could say the liberals win with the passage of the civil rights movement, but civil rights doesn't necessarily help you if you still can't feed yourself and you can't do a host of other things that remain a problem. And of course, at the time, it would have helped if they hadn't assassinated Martin Luther King and some of our other leaders at the time, but I don't have time for that right now. Um, then you had the Black Arts Movement with Larry Neal, Amiri Baraka, and then um, this idea of post-blackness in the 90s that Thelma Golden and other people were putting out in the early 90s, and I'm going to deal with that in a, little, in a slide about where I think some of this was a mistake and led to the unpreparedness of artists to deal with the social crisis of now with this idea of post that became popular in the early 90s. Uh, the scholar Marimba Ani in her book Yurugu, which critiques European philosophy and art, and Karelmu Welsh Asante being another one with her idea of Inzuri as it relates to uh, aesthetics. And this, so I came up with this definition. Uh, not to be confused with the debate among continental philosophers surrounding the concept of speculative realism, what I call dark speculative futurity is the late 20th century and early 20th, first century development, emergence, and philosophical perspective of non-white people in regards to their own agency or significance in relation to humanity or other life forms. Furthermore, how how they, I should say, describe or forecast phenomena in terms of their cultural purpose, principles, or goals in regards to global change, technological and social acceleration, ecological processes, and interstellar aspirations. And I was thinking about this idea um, in the last month. A lot of times, as uh, Marimba Ani talks about the concept of future time, when she wrote in the 90s, and most she talks about uh, future time, at least in a large swath of the world's population, is held hostage to the legacy of Judeo-Christian religion in terms of the time when they think of end time. You know, that's why one of the things I always find frustrating sometimes when I talk 
in my own community, they'll be like, oh, don't worry about it. Jesus is going to come back and work it out. I'm like, well, you know, Jesus created, helped create, God create the schools and everything else to help us figure this out, not to sit around and wait on him. And so this idea of end time and anyhow these end times, based depending on which faith tradition you're a member of, don't necessarily, they, they clash with each other in terms of how people think of future time. I believe in Christianity, they call it Kairos time. So what is Afrofuturism? Uh, last week, uh, it's not last week, time's moving so fast. A few days ago, I was in a discussion with Mark Derry in New York, and he kind of uh, came to my side of the argument in terms of uh, at the end of the Cold War during the inception of the neoliberal era, while conducting an interview with Samuel Delaney and other black artists intellectuals, Mark Derry mused speculative fiction that treats African-American themes and addresses African-Americans' concerns in the context of late 20th century and early 21st century technoculture and more generally African-American signification that appropriates images of technology and a prosthetically enhanced future might, for want of a better term, be called Afrofuturism. Now, at the time, Derry was really unaware of the long tradition of black speculative thought in the United States at that time when he coins this phrase, which I don't have a problem with. Uh, he just wasn't aware of the broader black speculative tradition. An earlier article that was written back in the 70s by Mark Fleffer that talks about black speculative literature talks about the parallel development of science fiction and black speculative thought, how they parallel each other, in, at least in the United States context. For example, to be unfree in the 19th century, to even write something about freedom was totally speculative at the time, being able to imagine freedom. And that's when you're talking about the socio-political imagination and why I talk about it being so important. Um, H.G. Wells had to write about rockets before generations later people would build those rockets. And so he talks about at the time black speculative thought and science fiction, which I'm not an English expert, but I understand it's still not respected as the rest, much as the rest of literature is but it's gotten fashionable in the sense that it seems to be kind of forecasting or a lot of um, what's happening now to us looks like science fiction. Going back to what Way Gibson said, that the future is already here, is just unevenly developed. The weaknesses of this early approach of what we call now call Afrofuturism 1.0. Uh, it's a downside to the Afrofuture is the tendency to dwell much, too much on imaginary spaces created by fiction and music rather than work at fusing these domains with functional science and technology. And that's why, oh my God, if I see any more exhibitions and stuff talking about aesthetics and fashion, I'm going to just, ah, uh, I mean, because as Mark Derry uh, during our discussion pointed out that Aesthetics and Walter Benjamin kind of alludes to this is one of the things I like about Benjamin. These can be easily co-opted to serve the interests of other people when you focus overly much simply on aesthetics. Its second weakness was the limited knowledge of future studies. You know, there's been a future studies tradition that's been going on that's not necessarily related to what the Italians were talking about in the early 20th century, but the use of technology to forecast social conditions, such as corporations like the RAND Corporation. For example, what's going on in the United States, a lot of the future studies, people already said a few years ago that the United States was going to go through political upheaval for about a decade, that it probably won't be able to work it out until the middle of the next uh, decade with this gridlock that's in the government right now. Third weakness, limited knowledge of, knowledge of Africa and its broader diaspora and traditions. It's been too American-centric until recently. And uh, one of my tasks I've done as the co-editor and the editor of the, uh, this follow-up volume is now reaching out to the broader African diaspora and people from Africa are now engaged with this. We're working on hosting a, a conference in uh, West Africa next summer uh, that's going to end up talking about this. Uh, fourth weakness, uh, geographical parochialism that influences weak philosophical praxis. Um, Paul Miller, or as some of you may have heard of DJ Spooky, came out with a book several years ago that talks about one of the weaknesses of the first wave of Afrofuturism that came out. It didn't have a philosophical basis, and it didn't have a serious concentration of scholars or activists to even uh, make it um, 
comprehensible to the broader public. Or something that's maybe even more easier to think about, they probably couldn't get a job talking about it. However, recent developments now are underway where students are now doing this as part of their dissertations, they're getting employment, and it has had other practical applications also that people are doing now in relation to grants, funding, and other things that are now, okay, it seems economically feasible to study this stuff and I can still pay my bills. And its fifth weakness, a Eurocentric perspective related to early formulation of Afrofuturism that wondered if the history of African peoples, especially in North America, had been deliberately erased. Some commentaries on Afrofuturity are a little more than European or Eurocentric studies of Afrofuturism. Now this is where, uh, during our, our, our discussion this past weekend, where I challenged Derry on the idea of history being erased. Well, an example I gave him, I said, if um, you look at something like DNA, and I'm sure in this society, whatever, don't police use DNA to establish a crime, correct? Yes, no? Yes. All right, well, if you look at the physical, phenotypical features and different colorations of, of uh, the United States African-American population and why we have these different shades of color, it's obviously conclude that a crime was committed. So the DNA evidence that shows that, whether it's through the rape of women in slavery or the use of black women in slavery to develop modern gynecology in the United States, or the recent movie that's now come out dealing with the life of Henrietta Lacks in terms of how her um, pieces of her body are appropriated to come up with HeLa cells, that, uh, things that we would now call a crime were committed. So history was not erased simply through scientific evidence. It, does exist to prove some of the things that previously we've been speculatively talking about. Afrofuturism 2.0 is the early 21st century technogenesis, and I borrowed that from Catherine Hale's idea of the co-evolving of people and technology. Reflecting counter histories, hacking or appropriating network software, database logic, cultural analytics, deep remixability, Neurosciences, enhancement and augmentation, gender fluidity, post-human possibility. The speculative sphere was transdisciplinary applications and has grown into an important diasporic technocultural pan-African movement. Uh, for example, one of the things, two points I want to raise here. One of the arguments I made a couple years ago at one of our Astro Blackness meetings that I thought that uh, the African uh, countries themselves would do more with Afrofuturism than even their North American kinfolk would, uh, simply because of the fact uh, if you think of Afrofuturism as in terms of military science and the fact that um, these countries control their own engineering schools and their own educational programmatics to take it places where um, people, African American or the diaspora, members of the diaspora in the West can only speculate about. Uh, a couple of those pictures there, I'll be mean, that's Sirius Kabiro, he's a, an artist in Kenya with these, um, uh, the glasses on. And the two lower pictures, those are pictures from Ghana uh, that I took pictures of that while I was le a lecturer, a summer lecturer over there a few years ago, where this idea of pan accuratism is a real idea and a project that is in serious discussion at the moment. Themes of second wave Afrofuturity. Uh, and these are descriptive, not necessarily prescriptive, are focused around metaphysics, aesthetics, theoretical and applied science, social science and programmatic spaces. Metaphysics meaning uh, as a branch of philosophy that you all are aware of, so that means studying people like um, uh, Marimba Ani or, or some of the works from other um, scholars related to future time as it relates to people of African descent. Aesthetics, which is the most popular branch of Afrofuturism that people tend to uh, focus on in the visual arts and music. And then theoretical and applied science, for example, people, uh, the digital science, Natrice Gaskins, um, she's a digital science who uses Afrofuturism in relation to design in terms of taking Afri African cosmograms and engages them in STEAM projects, which means is an acronym for science, technology, engineering, art, and math. Also in social sciences, um, the Afrocentric idea by Alefi Asante and others would be appropriated. And then programmatic spaces, um, 
events put on by people like Ifeoma Okoye and others in, in uh, England, such as Afro Futures UK, or the work of uh, 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 the black queer Afro futurist work done by Rashida Phillips and her partner, Kame Devstar in Philadelphia, that they do in terms of doing spaces where people are dealing with the concept of future time as it relates to working class people and how they manage time. Black speculative art and design. Uh, defined this a few years ago in terms of as a creative aesthetic practice, uh, and it came out as part of the Unveiling Visions exhibition that we had. And I'm going to move through some of this swiftly because I want you all to get some of it so we can get to the Q&A. The Black Speculative Arts Movement, of which I'm a co-founder of, I uh, founded, I co-founded this with Maya Crown Williams as a convention movement, as a vehicle to take these ideas around the community, and as an umbrella not a unified school of thought, but an umbrella term which deals with basic, different bases of inquiry. Challenges for the leadership, foresight, insight, and oversight, you know, seeing where things are going, understand why they're happening, looking in front of and how things are connected with everything else, dealing with the three driving forces that impact everyone now, globalization, technological acceleration, or whether you want to call it Moore's Law, and climate change. So some of these other challenges even more refined digitization, miniaturization, simulation, networking in the super net and AI, and environmental crisis. What are some of the strategies and solutions? Uh, some of the um, solutions and strategies that have come up is the idea of Afro-future types, which is a take on Lisa Nakamura's work dealing with cyber types in terms of, in relation to algorithms and framing, how do people of African descent in relation to their survival deal with deep time, forecasting 500 to 1,000 years in the future? And this idea of cult cult culturomics, which uses newspapers to forecast what's going to happen based upon, say, uh, and I believe this, uh, this work was originally done in Israel, this idea of culturomics, where you can, there are, you can use an algorithm and study the newspapers of a country for about a 40-year period and predict when the next upheaval is. And then the other strategy or solution, post-colonialism free from new colonialism, where you have the work of Nettie Kofer and her works, um, Who Fears Death and The Shadow Speaker, which talks about how to work through, you're not going to get through post-colonialism without some violence and coming out the other side in terms of how your humanity um, is dealt with. And it intersects with air futurity, and that's what I want to get into. Uh, a lot of the roots of contemporary Arab futurity can be traced back to people like Mustafa Mahmoud and Alim Salim in a literary sense with some of the work they've done. Um, and this I got out of an article, Ancient Black Astronauts and Extraterrestrial Jihads, Islamic Science Fiction as Urban Mythology. Arab Futurity is a literary critique of empire, a book that has come out proper. Um, in a popular way that the New York Times brought up recently, American War, a novel by Omar el Akkad, talks about a lot of what American empire has done in the Middle East that will be revisited to them within the next several decades as we emerge in terms of a civil war between the North and the South, and it's over the use of fossil fuel, drones, and other regional developments that go on in, in 2070 America to the first decade of the 22nd century. And I, in uh, preparing this, I draw a distinction between I would call Arab futurity and Gulf futurism, or Palestinian futurity, looking at a work by people like Amir Zuwabi, talking about, um, in his short um, essay, The Underground Ghetto City of Gaza, versus the Gulf futurism of Sophia al Maria. And Gulf futurism I kind of associate politically with. Um, neoliberalism in support of Western countries in terms of uh, the alliance of the Gulf, many of the Gulf states with Western interests in terms of uh, the politics in the region and how they use immigrants to build a lot of these skyscrapers and new buildings that they have um, and other issues that they have at that time. Themes of Arab futurity, the Palestinian context, notable figures, as I said before, Amir Zouabi, Larissa Sansour, Suleiman Majali. And one of the things that, uh, a question I raised earlier, you know, whether this sense of being in the diaspora, or were you born there? I, I suggest because of globalization, rather than thinking of the state or being born th there, 
the argument I made in relation to Afrofuturism and maybe a suggestion in terms of air futurity is thinking about this as a like an ecosystem in terms of how this branches out and how it looks after it crosses borders. And this whether it's this idea of uh, dystopian reality and um, pan-utopia. Now, the intersection of Islam and black diaspora intersections really goes back to the Bandung Conference of the 1950s, where in the lower picture there at the bottom, you have this idea, I believe you have Nasser in the same picture with Kwame Nkrumah, who takes ideas that start out in the African diaspora, and they eventually lead to the formation of the African Union, which is why I said a lot of the ideas that the African Union starts start out in its diaspora first. And it goes back to this idea where you see in the upper left-hand corner there, this idea of um, the way uh, scholars in the diaspora imagine or deal with uh, themes that go back to Egypt, to the upper right-hand corner, that you see uh, Sun Ra, the jazz um, artist, dealing with the, what's the name of this, this uh, conference space is the place. And one of the things in a lecture I dealt with um, uh, talking about where I bring up Sun Ra, rather than dwell on uh, the strangeness of Sun Ra, I often tell white Americans, I said, well, maybe you need to really think about is what did you all do to make black people want their own solar system? Okay, or say they're not even from Earth anymore. And a lot of this can go back to a book, um, some of the ideological tendencies from the rising tide of color, this fear of the West of being overrun by uh, the non-right world. Uh, the intersections, uh, as, as I believe uh, Yusuf Nuruddin in his article really talks about, he does a short critique of Sunni and Shia belief systems and cosmology as it relates to some of these these. Um, ideas related to the speculative, and he advances an argument that's really the, about, that's more heterodox in terms of although uh, the Muslim community and the black community is a, a minority, it has an outside inf an outsized influence in terms of how many uh, of its artists and leaders, whether it's Malcolm X, whether it's uh, certain um, musical performers, in terms of the, the influence that they have in urban communities. And he says, urban myths are instruments by which the poor and downtrodden struggle to make sense of their oppressive inner city experience. Urban myths give philosophical meaning to the quotidian facts of domination and exploitation. And what makes, I think, some of this, uh, this heterodoxic Islam attractive to people is both historic and their other intellectual readings. One, on a very simple level, since the people, the predominant people, at least in North America, who enslaved African Americans were Christians, uh, Islam does not require uh, necessarily in terms of their interpretation to forgive them for what they've done. And, and, uh, or as John Henry Clark would say, you, you can't both, you know, the master and the, uh, the slave can't be worshiping the same God. And so these motifs and themes are present in a lot of the, uh, what's produced in this heterodox intersection with Islam and urban mythology. Other examples, you have Latin futurity that's emerging now. Uh, recently, this idea, uh, Catherine Ramirez's work, which builds on Afrofuturism and this diet, Chicana futurism. Asia futurism, in terms of the book I have there, The Man in the High Castle by Philip Dick, because as many people in your own establishment know, the, uh, the United States is engaged in the what they're calling the Asian pivot now in terms of they want to focus less on this region and move more resources intellectually and militarily to deal with the coming threat coming from the Asian bloc of, of countries as a potential military and economic threat. And then finally, uh, a convergence of politics, culture, and futurity. Are we moving toward a clash of futurities, which is a take on Samuel Huntington's idea of a class of civilizations now. Now, one of the things I want to read an excerpt here as I close that a, um, Richard Slaughter came out with this 10 years ago and he talks about one form of dystopia or another is the most likely future for mankind at this point. Why such a bleak view? There are many reasons. Humanity cannot reinvent the inner worlds of those in power in a few years. It is the work of generations. Inequitable economic relationships with their ingrained pyramids of sacrifice cannot be overturned overnight. 
There will be no sudden enlightenment among the world's governments and no sudden upsurge of positive visionary leadership among state persons. They will continue to disappoint. The abstract goals of competing transnational enterprises will continue to drive a technological dynamic that has already forsaken notions of limits and has gone far beyond any conception of human need or positive social value. This dynamic is now poised to overwhelm the world's cultures with it, another series of revolutions for which they are utterly unprepared. And that is what is upon your society right now. Uh, this idea of building a wall. Uh, one of the things I had said, mentioned uh, recently, just looking over history, walls never stopped anything from happening. The Chinese built a wall and it couldn't keep the Mongols out. Uh, Hadrian built a wall and it couldn't keep the Scots out. Um, Athens, I believe, built some type of wall and it couldn't keep the Spartans out during the Peloponnesian War. And Trump's ridiculous idea of a wall on, along our border with Mexico um, I was, makes me think the Canadians probably want to build a wall on us to uh, keep us out. And so one of the things about walls, I think the West has a history of being anti-Semitic and anti-Islamic. And I think as the problems of this, of this region continue uh, as, as climate change is coming, they're going to have to come to a grips with uh, it won't be the first time the West has turned its back on Jewish people or Arab people. And, and those countries in the West, because they're going to be overwhelmed with their own problems to maintain internal stability, simply won't have the political will to stay engaged here in this region. And I think, uh, besides, building a wall will not keep out one bioterrorist who can then make a million people sick. And in a small country like this, as beautiful as it is, it would be like a perfect Petri dish uh, of being trapped inside something that just one person gets through. And, and that's, that's something that's just real when you talk about all the advancements in transhumanism and what people are doing in labs now. All over the world, uh, whether it's in the United States now, they're worried about how one person can get off a plane and make people sick. Now, now the artist, I hope I didn't depress you all too much, but I think with your creative ability, I think your job as artists is really to make the, uh, artists in, don't have power in and of themselves, but they have the ability to make the aesthetic gesture or point towards people like, man, this is something we should reconsider. And I think, uh, and as I close out, I'm saying we, I think we live in a time of um, demagogues and prophets in terms of which direction humanity is going to go over here over the next several decades. And I will close right there. Anyway, thank you all for having me.